and welcome back to Voyage of a Time Wanderer. Today I am going to be sharing my thoughts on six different Pride and Prejudice retellings. So this is a video that I've been thinking of making for a while as I have been reading more and more Jane Austen retellings and uh, I just finished reading my sixth Pride and Prejudice retelling, so I have five of them here uh, that I own and then one that I don't own. And I thought it would be uh, interesting, fun, to go through the six different uh, Pride and Prejudice retellings that I have read, rank them from my least favorite to my most favorite, and uh, I guess find out whether Jane Austen fan fiction lives up to the hype or not, and whether it's worth uh, reading a retelling of Pride and Prejudice or a Jane Austen work if you really like Jane Austen and want more of the characters. So as you'll see once I get into the books, there are the good, the bad, and the middling in this pile. There's some that I would highly recommend and some that uh, I didn't enjoy as much. Uh, overall, I have really enjoyed exploring Jane Austen retellings. It's one of the things that I think makes being a Jane Austen fan so special is that there are uh, endless derivative works, whether that is watching uh, movie adaptations or reading these variations, retellings, continuations that uh, seem to be so popular. So I guess my answer to the question, does Jane Austen fan fiction live up to the hype? Uh, my answer would be sometimes, and I think it takes a little bit of exploring what's out there to find out what kind of Jane Austen fan fiction uh, you will enjoy. In my reading, I've found out that I enjoy continuations more than variations, particularly continuations that follow more minor characters. So that's kind of where my bias is in these retellings. And without further ado, I will get started with my least favorite and work my way up to my most favorite of the six different Pride and Prejudice retellings I have read so far. So my least favorite of the six that I have read so far sadly has the most beautiful cover and that is Charlotte by Helen Moffat. And as you can probably guess from the title, this book is a continuation that follows Charlotte after the events of Pride and Prejudice and after her marriage to Mr. Collins. This book had some really beautiful writing in it and I was very hopeful that I was going to enjoy it because I found the author's writing style very beautiful. Some of the prose, uh, particularly at the beginning, I was quite enjoying. Sadly, this took a turn that I didn't really like and it ended up having an infidelity plotline that I think uh, wouldn't have been realistic to Austen's characters and their motivations as seen in Pride and Prejudice. And so for that reason, it's my least favorite just because I don't think uh, it's necessarily true to how the characters uh, would have behaved and how their moral compass was uh, as demonstrated in Pride and Prejudice. But I am keeping it in my collection because the cover is so beautiful and I do enjoy uh, kind of collecting Pride and Prejudice retellings. I think if you're someone who isn't bothered by infidelity plotlines, you might really enjoy this book because there's definitely uh, a lot of redeeming characteristics to it. It's really that plotline and that character decision that I disagree with, which made me not enjoy it. Uh, if you are someone who's a big Charlotte fan and you think that that wouldn't bother you, I would recommend checking it out. Otherwise, I would say of all the retellings, this is the one I would say to skip. Then coming in at number five, and this was kind of a surprise for me because I thought I was going to really enjoy this, is a book that I read for Jane Austen July this year, and that is Death Comes to Pemberley by P.D. James. P.D. James is a famous mystery author, and so this is a, a mysterious take on a continuation of Pride and Prejudice. This book is set, I would say, five to ten years after the events of Pride and Prejudice. And we open with Elizabeth and Darcy getting ready to host a ball at Pemberley when Lydia, uninvited, rolls up in a carriage screaming out the window that Mr. Wickham has been murdered. And kind of the rest of the book unfolds from that point. As someone who does enjoy reading mysteries quite a bit, I thought that this was a shoe in to be like a top favorite Jane Austen retelling and it just wasn't the case. I ended up giving this three stars, uh, so it was an okay read for me. If Charlotte goes in the bad category, this goes in the middling category. It was just kind of okay. I found it a bit boring. I was surprised how slow the action was. I listened to this on audiobook and I realized, I looked down at one point and we were 40% of the way through the book and they were still 
uh, had just kind of recovered the body. So it was kind of weirdly paced. The beginning part was really dragged out. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, maybe 40-50% took place over the course of just that one evening. And then we skip forward quite a bit in time to go straight to the trial and then the book is kind of finished. So it was paced a little bit strangely and it was just a little bit boring. There was a lot of talking and not a lot of investigation. So I found uh, a lot of character discussions and not very much kind of, you know, scoping out, investigating, interviewing potential suspects. There was just a lot of theorizing about the crime, which uh, I didn't enjoy as much. I think maybe because we weren't really in the headspace of uh, a detective or one of the magistrates, we were really staying with Darcy and Elizabeth, who were obviously a little bit removed from the actual investigation. Darcy took the stand as a witness as the owner of Pemberley, but otherwise they were kind of waiting around, waiting for things to happen. And so that is the reason why I ended up not enjoying Death Comes to Pemberley as much as I thought I would. I will say the last like 30% maybe, the pace really picked up and I enjoyed that quite a bit more. So it redeemed itself a little bit in my eyes and there was a few storylines that I liked how it wrapped up at the end. If you really really enjoy mystery novels, a particularly slow paced kind of more philosophical mysteries, uh, you might enjoy this book. Otherwise I would say it's not one that I think uh, every Pride and Prejudice fan should read. For Austin themed mysteries, I will say that I enjoyed The Murder of Mr. Wickham by Claudia Gray uh, quite a bit more. That book is not on this list because it's a little bit different than these other Pride and Prejudice retellings in that The Death of Mr. Wickham is a mashup of all of Jane Austen's books and characters. In that book, again, the Darcys are hosting a party, but characters from each of Jane Austen's books are there. So it's a little bit like the TV show Dickensian in that we're kind of combining all of Jane Austen's characters and plot lines into one big Austen universe. So it's not strictly a Pride and Prejudice retelling. But if you're looking for just a fun, Austin-esque mystery, that is the mystery I would recommend over Death Comes to Pemberley. Then book number four is the only book that I don't own physically and that is Unequal Affections by Laura Ormiston. This book is out of print I believe and for some reason seems to be going for absolutely insane prices on secondhand book websites. When I looked into trying to procure a copy it was going for like 200 plus dollars on Amazon which obviously I'm not going to pay, but it was available through my library and I think the audiobook is also on Audible. So if you are wanting to read this, don't pay $200. Uh, check and see if your library has it or uh, listen to the audiobook version on Audible. I did quite enjoy this book. I ended up giving it four stars, but uh, I think I went in with kind of the wrong expectations about what it would be about. And that's the reason why it disappointed me a little bit and why it's in the middle of the pack for my ranking of these Austen retellings. The basic premise of this book is what would have happened if Elizabeth had accepted Darcy's first proposal uh, before she'd had a change of heart about him and when there were unequal affections between them, when he uh, was you know, really in love with her and when she still was judging him quite harshly. Uh, which I thought was a very intriguing premise and I was excited to see where that storyline would go. My only complaint with this book was the scope of time that was covered. I had really hoped that this book would take us beyond the end of Pride and Prejudice into their marriage at Pemberley and kind of uh, I guess go for a slower paced examination of their married life, but instead it only covers the time from Mr. Darcy's proposal through the rest of the events of Pride and Prejudice up until their wedding. So I found that a little bit disappointing because um, besides the fact that they were engaged, otherwise a lot of the plot points of the second half of Pride and Prejudice remained in place. So it really felt like I was just reading a variation of Pride and Prejudice without having a whole lot of new material added. But the author did make up for that by keeping the characters feeling very true to Austen. So it was really enjoyable to be back in that world. And it felt a lot like I was reading Austen's writing. Uh, I think I wouldn't probably pick this one up again just because it did stick so closely to Pride and Prejudice that if I wanted that experience, I would just read Pride and Prejudice again. I didn't feel like it brought a lot new to the table. But it's still one that I am glad to have read as a fan, both because it's kind of rare and hard to get your hands on, but also just because it was an interesting intellectual exercise to consider 
what it would have meant if Elizabeth had been swayed by the promise of a future of stability rather than waiting until she had truly fallen in love with Darcy to accept his proposal. Then coming in at number three and the top book in my middling category is Longburn by Joe Baker. This is actually the first Pride and Prejudice retelling, the first Austen retelling, possibly the first classics retelling that I ever read so I have a soft spot in my heart for it. This book is all about the downstairs life at Longbourn and we are following along with the lives of the servants of the Bennett household. The storyline of the book uh, pretty much follows along the same time period as Pride and Prejudice, but uh, we are really following the drama that is occurring in the servants' lives rather than caring about what is happening to the upstairs mistresses at Longbourn. So while there's little sprinkles of tidbits of events from Pride and Prejudice, this really is very much its own story. And I think it would even work as a standalone historical fiction novel if you didn't know anything about Pride and Prejudice. There are certainly some events from Pride and Prejudice that have an impact on the servants' lives. Uh, and we see kind of uh, those events through their perspective in a really interesting way. But there's also so much unfolding in their own lives that we're following, whether that be drama, romance, familial relationships, or tensions between work colleagues. I really appreciated the way that this book uh, opened my eyes up to the role of the servants and also made me realize just how missing they are from the Austen narratives. I think that's also something that I really appreciate about the 2020 Emma adaptation. We really get to see how ever-present the servants would have been in the lives of these Austen characters in a way that doesn't really come through in Austen's original writing. Uh, the servants are very much uh, silent and silenced in her books, um, whereas Longbourn takes those little tidbits of information we had in Austen's writing and imagines a whole world around them. This is a retelling that I would definitely recommend to fans of Pride and Prejudice because I think it adds a new perspective that we didn't get in the original text and illuminates a lot about what life would have been like for people who weren't fortunate enough to have been born, landed gentry, or fairly upper class uh, in the Regency era. So we are down to my final two Austen retellings and these are the two that I would consider like truly essential reading for a Pride and Prejudice fan. If you really love Pride and Prejudice and you haven't read either of these two books, I think you are missing out. These are both five-star reads that are near and dear to my heart, and the plot lines of these books have become canon for me. Uh, this is what happened to these two characters after the end of Pride and Prejudice, and there's nothing you could say that could convince me otherwise. So coming in at number two is The Other Bennett Sister by Janice Hadlow. This is quite a long book. My edition comes in just over 450 pages, so we are getting a deep dive into the inner life of Mary Bennett. Um, so Mary Bennett is the titular other Bennett sister. One of the things that I really appreciate about this book is that it covers a long stretch of time. So there's a couple of parts to this book. We get to see Mary Bennett's perspective during the events of Pride and Prejudice. And that was very, very enlightening to see how she might have been feeling in some of the key scenes in Pride and Prejudice. Uh, it definitely made me a lot more sympathetic to her. And this really uh, emphasized, I think, the failings of both of the Bennett parents. So if you are a Mr. Bennett apologist, this book might be really challenging for you because it really highlights uh, some of the flaws to his parenting, not just uh, the flaws that are more evident in Mrs. Bennett. So I think like probably at least a third of this book is the events of Pride and Prejudice told from Mary's perspective. And like I said, there's some events now that I'll never look at the same after reading this book, just because um, things that were kind of funny in Pride and Prejudice aren't so funny when you see it from Mary's perspective. And then the other two thirds of this book are following her through past the end of Pride and Prejudice. And I really enjoy the fact that we get to see a lot of the characters. So she spends time with Mr. and Mrs. Collins and I absolutely love the way that that part of this plot is dealt with. And that section of this book, rather than Charlotte, is where uh, I take my headcanon of Charlotte from. I think it portrayed some of the potential difficulties in the Collins' marriage very sympathetically, and I really appreciated the way the author handled that. 
And then my favorite part of this book is the time that Mary spends with the gardeners, both in London and in the Lakes District. And we really get to see her blossom on her own, separate from the other sisters that were kind of an overpowering force in the lives of the Bennets and in Marytown, where uh, Mary had always been overlooked because of the exuberance and the beauty and kind of just the all-encompassing nature of her four sisters. So when we get Mary on her own in London and in the Lakes District, uh, that's when we really get to see Mary for who she is as her own woman. There are a few wonderful romance plot lines in this book, so if you have been eager to see Mary get a happy ending, uh, this book will not disappoint you. And there's also just a lot of beautiful, beautiful writing and uh, nature descriptions and poetry. Wordsworth and his poetry features really heavily in this book. So there's excerpts of his poetry and nature walks in the Lakes District that are just beautiful to read about. This book really did feel like reading another Austen novel and like I said it changed some of my perspective towards uh, events in Pride and Prejudice so I would consider this to be basically required reading if you're a fan of Pride and Prejudice. Uh, this just adds so much depth, particularly to Mary's character, but also to so many of the other side characters that we know and love from Pride and Prejudice. And it is a book that I'm sure that I will reread at some point in the future. And then coming in at number one, this is a book that constantly battles for first place uh, between it and the other Bennett sister, but today I am feeling like it is my number one favorite Pride and Prejudice retelling, and that is What Kitty Did Next by Carrie Kablame. This book is obviously following Kitty and Kitty's story, and Kitty was a sister that I had kind of overlooked um, prior to reading this book. She really was Lydia's shadow to me and therefore not that interesting a character. Uh, I was even more intrigued by Mary Bennett when I was originally reading Pride and Prejudice. And so uh, having a whole book examining what Kitty's life would have been like after the end of Pride and Prejudice uh, made me appreciate her and her potential in a whole new way. We get to see what might have happened to Kitty after she has the negative influence of Lydia removed from her life. And when she has the full uh, weight of both of her parents' attention on her for the first time in her life. And she also spends quite a bit of time in the households of her married sisters, Jane and Elizabeth. And so we get to see how she might have matured given these more positive influences in her life. I love that we got to spend a lot of time in both London and Pemberley with the Darcys and the Bingleys. So it was fun to get uh, little glimpses into those characters' lives as well. And I felt like the characterization and the writing in this book felt very true to Austen's writing style and Austen's characters, which I always appreciate in a retelling, when they stay true to the core of the characters that Austen had created. And it really does feel like um, something that could have been a continuation of her writing. This book has beautiful seasonal writing. There's a, a particularly memorable scene that takes place during the Frost Fair in 1814, which is a real event when the Thames River froze over and there was kind of a winter festival held on the ice. Uh, that was something that was fascinating to learn about from a historical perspective and also just really beautifully written about in What Kitty Did Next. And I also appreciate that this book gave Mr. Bennett uh, a bit of a redemption arc. So like I said, if you're a Mr. Bennett apologist, the other Bennett sister does not portray him in a very good light, which I think is probably fairly accurate. But What Kitty Did Next is written for Mr. Bennett apologists because it acknowledges his flaws, but it gives him a chance to redeem himself and chart a new way forward and a new relationship with some of his daughters. And so uh, if you want to see him become a better father, What Kitty Did Next gives him the opportunity to do that. And of course, there's also a little bit of romance in this book as well. So like the other Bennett sister, this book really changed the way I think about Kitty. Uh, so even when I'm reading and watching Pride and Prejudice now, I have the Kitty from this book in my mind. And again, it's one that I think any fan of Pride and Prejudice should read and would really enjoy reading. And I think it adds a lot to not just Kitty's character, but to uh, a lot of the characters that we know and love, like Mr. Bennett. Uh, and for that reason, it is my number one Pride and Prejudice retelling that I have read to date. 
So those are the six Pride and Prejudice retellings that I have read so far uh, and my ranking and review of each one of them. If you have read any other Pride and Prejudice retellings, I would be very curious to know about them because uh, I love Pride and Prejudice so much that not only do I want to keep rereading Pride and Prejudice for the rest of my life, but I also want to keep examining those characters and that world in new ways. So I'm always curious to pick up new retellings and I would love in a couple of years to be able to do a part two to this video with another five or six retellings. So if you have retellings to recommend to me, uh, I would definitely be interested to hear those recommendations and check out those books in future Jane Austen Julys. I think I want to try reading one of the retellings that's from Darcy's perspective next because that's kind of an angle that hasn't been touched on yet in the retellings that I have read. So that is the direction I think that my next um, Pride and Prejudice retelling reading will head in, but I'm definitely open to hearing any recommendations that you might have. And if you're watching this video because you are interested in picking up a Jane Austen retelling or a Pride and Prejudice retelling, maybe for the first time I hope that my ranking was informative and helped you to make a choice about which one of these books you might enjoy the most. And one of the great things about being part of a fandom that has been around for over 200 years now like the Janeites is that there is such a wide range of books out there that are playing with her characters and her settings. So I've just really enjoyed uh, being able to revisit the world of Pride and Prejudice from the perspectives of different characters and kind of different derivatives of the main plot. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing my thoughts on these six Pride and Prejudice retellings and until next time, enjoy wandering through the pages of a good book. Bye.